So there was a question just in the hall a minute ago, did I meet John Kabat-Zinn when I was in Massachusetts? And I did not meet John Kabat-Zinn there this time, but John did start his practice at the retreat center that I, I was teaching at, so a bit of information. Yeah, and just <clears throat> going back to some of the reflections that I was just offering about how nice it is to be to be able to directly know this kind of good feeling of being around people who care enough to cultivate live, the qualities of living a mindful life right? at a time when we turn on the news and it's not usually good news that we're seeing. It can feel like untrustworthy out there in many ways. And yet we can really know directly the power of feeling relatively safe, relatively at ease among others who are practicing. And one way that happens is because we're sort of doing this radical thing of reorienting in life from being a person who's always trying to get it right and and yet very confused and making a lot of mistakes to being a person who cares more about sensitivity than always the outcome, right? always the goal and so much caring about the goal. But caring about this heart that's sensitive, this heart that learns how to care in the middle of any moment that we're living. And I don't know about you, but it feels really, really sweet, really trustworthy to be around other people who care enough right now to be mindful. It's not like we have to be human beings who aren't going to make mistakes ever, but really to show up for ourselves and to remember that we're all showing up in this way. Everybody in this screen, everybody in this hall is showing up because we're trying to learn how to reorient in the direction of being a learner. Because in this In a moment when we're showing up to learn something, we're really being present. Because you can't learn if you're not real. So if we're really going to learn, if we're really going to learn how to be kind, if we're really going to learn what it's like to be human, if we're going to learn to relate to each other differently, to be skillful, then we first have to be real. We first have to know what it's really like. What's it really like to be here? What's it really like to be me? What's it really like to be a human being? And so there's a lot of, there's vulnerability, there's sensitivity, there's intimacy in this path that we're that we're on this path of practice, no matter where we are, no matter how long we've been at this, even if it's just been five weeks sporadically, that's really fine because every moment that we care to show up as a learner, it's it's setting that habit, that good habit in motion. Setting this habit in motion of being a human being who's trustworthy. Sometimes when you'll see teachers coming into the hall, this is happening on retreat, come into the room and maybe put our hands together and just take a bow at the altar. And that can feel kind of funny depending on what our histories have been with religion or practices like this. But really for me, this bow to the altar is like a bow to being real. Like the Buddha was this person, this human being just like you and I who who cared enough to be real again and again and again. And it was kind of amazing that he was able to 
watch his mind, watch his heart, be sensitive and intimate with the way things are, to understand what it means to be a human being, to keep again and again and again, moment by moment, asking the question, what's it like to be me? What's it like to be human? How do I know? What does it feel like? And that he was able to do this so often that he had he has all these maps and all this teaching to share with us. And so it's really important to remember that that even if the teachings feel amazing or we can sort of be captivated by the, the the nuances of this path and even how difficult it is that it's so hard in so many complicated ways. It can feel like that, right? God, how am I ever going to learn all this stuff? That really at its essence, this path is about being here, being here and now, being in our bodies, knowing what we feel, to the best of our ability, using the information that we receive from moments when we remember to connect, when we remember to be here, using that information well. And so in this way, it can this practice is far reaching. It can take us every all into all the nooks and crannies of our crannies of our lives. Into our relationships, into our workplaces into these ordinary moments when we're getting gas or taking the bus or getting groceries or anything like that. Because of this kind of radical way that we're, we're like pivoting. Instead of, I'm just going to be a goal-directed creature and not really care so much about what's happening internally, and about the manifestation of that internal learning on the external. I'm just going to get the goods, right? I'm going to learn this skill. I'm going to check it off. But instead, we're saying like, oh, I'm wondering what it's like to be me now in this moment, in this really simple moment. And then we'll see how that matters. There's this really wonderful teaching that I appreciate, and it, it kind of sums up, it feels like to me it sums up how, why this, why this practice matters and how, it's, how broad it is, right? The Buddha said that there are like four, four things to remember when we're practicing. And the first one is, the first two are about how we relate to the kind of the, the stuff we don't want to see about our inner experience. And I think Mark has talked about the hindrances in this class a little bit already. And so some of what we notice when we start to become aware, when we start to care, care about sensitivity in our lives, not just in a single moment where we're sitting, but all throughout our lives, is that it's no picnic. <laughs> we often notice, notice aspects of our hearts and minds that aren't, that we don't really want to admit all the time. Like, I don't want to admit that I'm, that I feel as anxious as I do most of, as often as I do, right? I don't often want to admit that I'm judgmental or critical. I don't want to admit how much self-hatred can flow through this human experience. Right? I don't want to admit those things, but they're real. And so when I practice being real, then I'm going to see that too. That when my partner can do very simple things, I can get really activated. And, and if I'm not careful, then I act those, then I act those habits out. But with mindfulness, then we can learn how to respond in moments like this, in moments when what we see is not what we want to see. Because that's a part of the path, too. And so these four ways of living, really, is what, what I might say, four ways of living. The first two are about how what we do when we connect with these aspects of heart and mind that we 
aren't proud of or don't want to see, but we're committed to being a learner and to being real and to knowing what it's like to, hum to be a human being. And so we're brave enough to say yes to these moments too because we can learn like, oh, this isn't about me, right? This is a human experience. And instead of just being a human experience in somebody else's heart, I can see how it's a human experience that lives here in this heart. And when I see that, then we're not so different, right? It becomes harder to hate, harder to con condemn ourselves and each other when we can start to s see the impersonal nature of experience. Like, oh wow, all human, this is not so unique to me. I don't get to own this. And so these first two ways of living are about how we relate to the unwholesome or the unskillful, the unskillful conditioning in our hearts, the unskillful habits of heart and mind. And the first tip is that we learn to appreciate simplicity. Right? And what is, it doesn't mean that we have to go live in a cave, but it does mean that we care about being really present when we, when every time we remember it, it means that we're not, we're not, we're no longer committed to living a distracted life, but we're committed to living a present life. And so when we're doing the dishes, we're just going to do the dishes. And when we're having a conversation with a friend, we're really going to be present. We're going to pay attention to what's moving in my heart, what's moving in our friend's heart, right? We're going to really attune. It means when we're walking, we're just going to feel the body. We're going to walk, know what it's like, what it's like to be human now. And we're going to take moments, we're going to take time to sit and really feel our inner experience in ways that we don't, that it, in ways in which it's hard to when we're busy. And so we're going to learn how to value a kind of simple life, a more simple life. It doesn't mean that the world gets more complicated, less complicated, or our lives get less complicated, or relationships get less complicated. It just means that we're going to care enough to be there, like, oh yeah, I care about being a learner, so I'm going to really feel this. I'm going to know what it's like to be here right now for this, in this moment, because this matters. And in this way, we, we learn that some of the problems that we find ourselves in as human beings, some of the challenges in our lives are often born out of this neurotic habit of always chasing shiny objects, right? Of always looking for something better, looking for an ex escape. And the defended heart does this, so we don't want to somehow condemn those that reality either. But when things get simple, we learn that we don't have to, we don't always have to look for an escape route, that we can actually be here, we can feel this, right? And we learn that because we've cultivated that habit of being here in ordinary moments. And so then when I'm, we have cultivated that habit in ordinary moments, then when I feel something that doesn't make me excited, some unpleasant sensation in the heart or you know even a lot of thinking a racing mind a ruminating mind you know then we can just have the courage because we've already established the habit and because we know that we want to be in our lives we want to be in our lives so that we can live in a real way that we already have this habit established to be here the heart knows how to say yes because it's learned that, because we've cultivated it, right? So it doesn't actually matter what the experience is that we're noticing. It doesn't matter if it's anger, shame. It doesn't matter if it's a lot of wanting or hating. Right? It doesn't matter, because mindful awareness has already developed the habit to be there. Oh, yeah, right? So then we get to be brave. We learn how to be brave. And actually, we learn that because the habit 
develops with time. And so that, that courage is not even something that we have to summons up because it's already there for us. It's, it's there naturally because the habit has brought it along. So the first life tip is to be simple because in this capacity to be simple, we learn how to be brave. And the second life tip is when unwholesome habits or unskillful habits arise, like shame or anger or fear or, you know, impulses that might have us do things that aren't skillful, then we, we practice not reacting to them, right? We practice not reacting. And we might call this abandoning. We practice not indulging them. We practice not feeding them. Right? So because we've gotten good at watching our minds, then when a kind of ruminating thought comes through, you know, like, I'm, I'm a bad person, I never get things right, I'm never going to be good enough, whatever. You know, we can, our neurotic habit, when we're not mindful, is to just like, oh yeah, that is who I am, that is who I am, right? And then we start to believe that. But because we've been practicing mindfulness, we've been practicing presence, we've been practicing intimacy, then we learn how to recognize that at some point, the beginning, the middle, or even after we've been thinking for a while. And then we feel that and we go, oh, this isn't, this is just a thought. Or this is just an emotion. And I know how to be with this, right? And I know that I don't have to take it personally because it's not mine. This is just what it's like to be human. It's not specific to me. And so in that moment, that wisdom that arises then and allows the mind to abandon that unskillful habit. And so when unskillful habits come, when unskillful habits arise, then we have that, we have that capacity that's there to abandon. And sometimes it take, might take a little bit of our effort. We might be watch, watch ourselves in these moments when unskillful, and this can be a really kind of good practice in relationship with each other. Right, with our friends, our partners, our family. In a moment when we're maybe in a heated discussion, and I see this in my relationship with my wife, that we're in a, a conversation and perhaps we're disagreeing about something, and I watch this kind of self-righteous energy, right? And I want to be right, and I want to, you know, her to be wrong. <laughs> and But I can feel that. Right? And it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel trustworthy, right? And I get a little nervous, like, because I felt it so many times, like, oh, you might, you're going to say something, if you're not careful here, you're going to say something that's going to be damaging. It's going to damage the relationship, it's going to hurt her, you're going to feel bad. And because I've seen this train wreck play out again and again and again, when I feel that self-righteous energy arise in the body, I go, oh no, let's not get on that train, sweetie, right? We better be careful here. And, and it, sometimes it takes a little effort because that impulse is strong. I might have to walk away or I might have to change a subject or I might have to just not say anything. Right? But it is possible to abandon the unskillful, the unwholesome, with practice and time. And that's what we're, you know, that's really the, the power. That's the power of our, our practice in these moments. And then tonight we're going to practice a little loving kindness practice. And so the second pro tips for life that the Buddha offered were about the wholesome or the skillful habits of mind. And one of them is to cultivate the good. Cultivate goodness. Right? And the second, then the fourth one is to, when that goodness arises, when it's there, when we feel it, when we know it in our hearts, then to protect it. Right? Because that's going to help us be decent human beings. It's going to help us relate to ourselves and each other well. So we cultivate wholesome or skillful mind states. We cultivate habits of mind that are going to be beneficial to ourselves and to each other. So in a moment, 
when self-righteousness arises, there might be, you know, some wisdom that encourages us to, me, thankfully, to abandon, right, to abandon that, which is not skillful. And there might be an instinct to want to feel into that patience that's there that lets that moment come and go. Because that's a beautiful, healthy, wholesome, skillful mind state, patience, right? So there might be a little patience that arises like, oh, sweetie, be careful right here. Let me just be patient. Allow this moment to come and go so that you don't say something that you regret. Right? And then I might want to linger in that patience, right? Cultivate and linger in that patience when it arises there so that I really feel it so I know what it's like so that I know that, remember that this heart knows how to be good, knows how to be patient, knows how to be kind. And so sometimes we need to do direct practices that allow us to cultivate these habits of mind that are really useful. And one of the ways that we might cultivate directly habits of mind are to practice what's called the, the divine abodes, these four these four heart qualities, these four beautiful emotions, these four different aspects of what we might call love. It's not always the best word, love, because love means different things to us, but these aspects of kindness, right? This kind of generally general friendliness, this capacity to see yet, say yes in, a mo in any moment to our life as it is. And then this willingness of the heart to say yes, even when it's painful. Right? Even when we feel our own pain or someone else's, that's what we might call compassion. Oh, yeah, right? And to wish, to have a wish that that suffering is alleviated in some way. Right? It might not be immediate, it might not even happen, but this heart's goodness that really cares about pain and sorrow and suffering, both our own and, and others. And then the third aspect of the third uh, flavor or uh, emotion, the, the third of the Brahma Viharas is, is called mudita or appreciative joy. And that is this heart quality that appreciates goodness in the world and delights in that, right? We see someone laughing and we smile back like, oh, it's, I'm glad you're happy, right? <laughs> I saw some kids playing at the end of my block today. And they were just out there kind of joking around and pushing each other. I don't know what they were doing, but they were really giggling. And it made me happy to see kids uh, playing like that, even when it was drizzly outside. So the kind of lightness of heart, the appreciation that arises when we see goodness or good fortune of others. And then the fourth aspect, the fourth flavor of the fourth emotion in this quad quadrant, the four Brahma Viharas, is this kind of wisdom that allows us to stand up in the middle of life as it is, right? To not shrink away, to not seek out an escape route when things are the way that they are, right? And it's wisdom that does that because wisdom understands that this experience is conditioned, it's not mine, it's a force of nature, it's not permanent, right? And I know how to let things come and go. And we've all had moments that have been really difficult for us and we'll have many more. And it takes a lot of strength and courage to be able to be there in those moments, right? If you've ever been with a loved one who's having a hard time, it's hard to watch somebody struggle, right? So often he, the human instinct is to try to fix it, right? Tell them what to do, tell them to get over it, or walk away like, oh, I can't take this, I don't know what to do, right? And those are not gonna be, those aren't great habits. So with the habit of being present, then we get to feel the heart that goes, oh, I don't really know what to do here. I don't know how to help. 
but I know how to be here for it, right? I don't know what to help you, or I don't know how to help you, but I know how to be here for it. And that goes for our own pain, our own in our own hearts, in our own lives, right? Do we want to just rely on our habits of distraction and denial? Or do we want to actually cultivate the courage to be right in the middle of every single moment of our life, right? I want to cultivate the courage to be here for my life because I want to have the capacity even when my body starts to fail, even when I'm on my deathbed, for example. I want to have the courage to be here. And so this fourth emotion, equanimity, it's called, is this real capacity to be in the middle of our lives just as it is, without needing it to be different, but to be really courageous there. And the way that we cultivate that possibility is by understanding, is by developing understanding, right? understanding what it's like to be human so that we don't have to take things personally. And that takes time and patience. So our loving kindness practice can be a real <clears throat> can be a real <clears throat> force for us. This is a practice that the Buddha taught as an antidote to fear. He taught this practice when his students were practicing in the forest, and you know, all kinds of wild things happen in the forest. <laughs> so they needed some some way to help. To, under, to feel like they were going to be able to do that. So it's not a practice that changes the external conditions, right? Loving kindness didn't make the forest be cool. It allowed people to know how they could be in the middle of difficulty and still be okay. So that's what loving kindness is. It's really, it changes, it changes our hearts. I think I'll pause here and maybe we'll all guide us in loving kindness practice now. What does that sound good? Okay. So why don't we get ourselves into a, a comfortable sitting posture. Taking a couple of deep breaths. It's good to remember that the body, the nervous system has this natural ability to regulate, to settle. That's something that we can often feel in the out breath and the exhaling. And also remembering that this quality of loving kindness, this is actually very simple. Sometimes we can put a lot on loving kindness, like it has to be big and demonstrative and 
deeply feeling, but actually it can be very light and very ordinary. And it's here for us in moments when the heart knows how to say yes. Heart knows how to connect. And so as we begin, we can just connect with the body. Just to feel what it's like to have a body. Noticing these moments when the heart isn't in contention with what we feel. It's just sensations coming and going. The body doing what the body does, breathing, moving a little. And how, at least in moments, there's no making it, trying to make it be different. There's just some acceptance. The body's like this. Really see if you can Taste. Taste that non contentious attitude. We might call this loving kindness. Feeling into the body, not resisting anything in the world, not holding on, not resisting, just remembering to be here again and again. We can take a moment to appreciate this body. All of its systems working together. All of its activities. And so we feel the body just appreciating all that it does, adjusting to our demands, requests.
when offering our, our good wishes right here and now to this body as it is. May it be healthy. May this body be healthy. May this body be at ease. May this body be safe and protected in all ways. body be healthy may this body be at ease may this body be safe and protected in all ways also bring to mind a being who you care about, a being who's easy to love, a friend perhaps, or a teacher. Just appreciating this person in your life. So the shared reality that they too have a body that needs to be cared for, a body that's imperfect, a body that has a life of its own, that systems and processes. Appreciating this shared human reality. We all have bodies to take care of, bodies to appreciate. When the time is right, you can offer your heartfelt good wishes to this other being. be happy and peaceful.
May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. you're ready, you can invite this person to be near you. I'm sitting next to you or in front of you. And this time bringing to mind an image of another dear friend. He's going with whoever comes forward. Appreciating their presence. to have a body to take care of just like we do. Sometimes difficult, sometimes not. But feeling into the shared reality. Allowing the shared reality to soften the heart. And when you're ready, you can offer your heartfelt good wishes to this friend. You can either use the phrases I'm offering or you can make up your own. May you be happy and peaceful May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong.
May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe. protected. May you be healthy and strong. When you're ready, you can invite this person to sit near you, maybe on the other side or somewhere close. And with their goodness as a support, this time bring to mind someone you don't know very well, someone you've seen in the grocery store or in your building. Or maybe on the bus. Remembering that it's, it's hard to be human for all of us. And when you're ready, offering your good wishes, your kind wishes, May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected.
May you be healthy and strong. Invite this person to be near you somewhere. Remembering that it's tough being human. It's not easy for us. We get confused. So let's offer our good wishes. Allow loving kindness to flow in all directions. Offering loving kindness to all beings in front of us. A light, caring heart extended in front of us. May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. Offering the same benevolent energy all beings behind, behind us. May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe. and protected. May you be healthy and strong. And to all beings to the right of us, May you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected. May you be healthy and strong. And to all beings to the left of us, may you be happy and peaceful. May you be safe and protected.
May you be healthy and strong. And to all beings above and below, all around, All beings, be at ease. May all beings be healthy, happy, protected. May it be so. When you're ready, returning to your breath, remembering the simplicity of the practice, this heart's capacity to say yes, to feel. Be aware. Just resting here for another minute before you hear the sound of the bell. Take a minute to stretch your legs if you'd like. Just the body. Thought we'd spend the next 20 minutes or so in conversation. So if there are any questions about practice or reflections about what you've been learning over the past week, or questions about the loving kindness practice today. You know that you've spent some time last week exploring what gets in the way of awareness practice. So if you want to share anything that you've learned about that, it would be great too. First, see if there's anything that anybody in the, in the room here would like to offer. No pressure. <laughs> How about anybody on Zoom? Nothing, huh? <laughs> Any questions about practice? Yeah. Well, I was wondering um, that not just when I practice, but a lot of times I seem to stumble over, like, um, I think it's been referred to as like the pain body, or like just kind of like a wall. Feels like I kind of run into it, and every time I run into it, it's like it sends a, a brain signal kind of thing that says you're in pain. 
trying to dissolve that or if it's just letting that be or if it's something in the middle. You want to say your name for me if you would? Yeah. Will? Yeah. So Will is asking this question about working with either real or imagined perceived pain, right? So sometimes maybe there's a anticipation of pain or something like that. Yeah, either physical or emotional or both will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so how, how to work with that? That's a really good question. But maybe the, the first place to start is to remember that, you know, that our, our bodies, our nervous systems are so sensitive. We're always walking around with very sensitive hearts and bodies, right? And so because of that sensitivity, we develop all kinds of coping strategies, even without our knowing it, right? It's just ways of being in a, a world that's not easy to be in, in these sensitive embodied, as these insensitive, sensitive embodied beings. And so there's going to be moments when we anticipate pain or anticipate danger, anticipate fear, and the body reacts to that, right? It might tense up or get constricted or the heart might close because we get a whiff of something that reminds us of another moment or remembers, reminds us of something we've seen or heard. And that's just really natural, right? And so even though we're cultivating this capacity to be open-hearted and right in the middle of our lives in a, a kind of open and sensitive way that the, the body, the heart might have a, other ideas <laughs> for us, right? And so we can appreciate these defensive habits of mind when they arise because they're here naturally, they're here lawfully. They've here, they're here because of the conditions of our lives, the conditions of the world we live in, right? They're here because we've the system has learned this habitual way of responding. And so we don't have to deny or somehow condemn, you know, when ourselves, when fear arises or when anger arises or when the body gets tight or remembers to brace or something like that. We don't have to like go, oh no, that's not the right thing to do or what's wrong with you? You know, we're practicing mindfulness now, let's go because this is just nature. It's as much this body and this nervous system and all the habits of mind are as much as natural as this, the rain and the sun and the earth and all of the natural world. You know, it's all just there because of the conditions, right? The grass wouldn't grow unless the rain came and the the earth wouldn't be the earth without the sun. You know, these are, we wouldn't somehow condemn nature for being nature, but our bodies and our hearts are just nature too. They're, it's just natural, naturally occurring habits given the conditions in and around us. And so that's one way to relate to all of our habits, right? The habits to defend, the habits to get tight, the habits to brace or get ready for a fight, whatever that is. It just, oh yeah, is it possible to be with this too? Is it possible to accept this? Is it possible to be here? And we might not want to, you know, we might re remember that this, this habit or this, what we, the skill that we can develop to abandon what's not skillful, right? So if we feel the system activated, then we might know that, we can feel that, and we can elect, allow that to come and go, trusting that nature will run its course like it always does, right? Everything comes and goes. We don't have to react to it. It's, a, it's a, often a choice, right? And that choice gets stronger and stronger with time and practice because we develop a, a greater and greater capacity to be here, be with the difficult moments of our lives, right? The difficult emotions that we might experience, for example. Yeah. Thanks for the good question. Let's see if anybody else has a response, and then we'll come back to you, Will, okay? Yeah. Is there another question over here? I guess it kind of builds off of what Paul gave you in the shadow. Yes. You 
from Shelley and Will had brought up but back to your original question on what gets in the way of uh, practice. Um, for me, I, I, I suppose uh, it would be the same as anybody else in that it starts with um, being lost in thought, right, uh, is a hindrance to getting out of being lost in thought. Uh, for me, that looks like very unskillful thinking that leads me to be lost in thought. And it, how it builds off of what we're talking about <clears throat> and what we've been talking about is um, this unskillful thought is it's very painful. Um, and then in those moments, I often find myself failing to abandon uh, this thing because uh, there was this piece that you, you had referenced earlier, Shelley, uh, and being able to note that, oh yeah, this thing isn't me, this unskillful thought, that, or this unskillful experience. Um, at least for me, what that looks like is saying that that is me, actually. Um, and so it's kind of like, for me at least, it becomes this uh, this trap of being lost in thought. Because I, I, I reject uh, pretty forcefully often um, not letting that type of thing pass. That's like the, the only place, really. Say, so your na say your name for me. My name is Dan. OK, so Dan, I don't know if you can hear. Could you hear Dan on Zoom? Can you hear? No? OK, I'll repeat the question. So Dan is just um, asking a question about how to work with thoughts and especially thoughts that are sticky and uh, might, you know, Dan is saying that they sometimes get in, interfere with present moment awareness, right? And yeah. thoughts that you might not like or appreciate, right? They don't feel that skillful. Is that, is that about it? Yeah, Dan? yeah that's, that's right. And especially, they're especially sticky. Especially sticky thoughts. Okay. So raise your hand if you if you notice this about yourselves too, especially sticky thoughts that you don't really want or like or <laughs> they don't feel that useful. Yeah, and how easy it is to get swept away by them. Oh yeah, this is like a very important territory in practice, working with thoughts, working with the thinking mind. And there is an art to it, right? Because thoughts are subtle. This is what makes them so sticky. What makes it so tricky to work with thoughts is one, they feel incredibly personal. And two, they're so subtle that we miss them most of the time, right? So it's really good news when we catch our mind thinking. And so on a very basic level, one of the things we can do is just be delighted when we notice the mind is thinking. Right? When we notice any kind of thought. Because that we're on we're on to something, right? We're noticing, we're noticing in a really subtle way. And we and so we can just we can see if it's possible to just appreciate that we're noticing thinking, right? Without so much getting hooked into the content. Now the content is gonna sweep us off our feet some of the times. Instead of noticing thought, we're gonna get we're gonna notice that we're thinking. And we're going to get seduced by the thinking. It's going to be so captivating that we're just going to become somebody who's thinking instead of learning how to, instead of in that moment, actually being aware of thought, right? And so we can also just accept that this is part of being a human being too, right? That our thoughts kind of, they often, they come from somewhere. And often we don't know where that place is. Sometimes we might notice an emotion and thoughts seem to come out of, arise out of that emotion, or sometimes they can arise out of a kind of energy, so maybe a busy energy or a frantic energy and the mind starts really thinking a lot, or, or maybe a kind of a sluggish kind of energy and we might notice this fuzzy kind of dreamlike thinking, right, that might be there. Sometimes we'll notice that we're thinking in images and sometimes thinking in words. There's all kinds of, all kinds of thinking and all kinds of reasons for our thinking. So we're not going to be able to sort of get to the bottom of it most of the time, but we can, but we can learn to recognize thought 
and learn to appreciate that the mind thinks just like any other sense organ, right? In any, at any moment, there's, there's only six categories of experience that a human being can know. And that is what we take in through any of the five senses, what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we taste, right? And also the six would be the activity of thinking, the activity of the mind, right? Just like the sound is the activity of the ears, sight is the activity of the eyes, thinking is the activity of the mind, right? So there's no avoiding being a human being that thinks that's just what the human, that's just what's going to happen. We're not going to be human beings that can somehow transcend thought. So we're not going to get rid of that. Often our, and so we can just, that's one way to relate to thinking is just by accepting it, right? Accepting it, being delighted when we can catch thoughts, un feeling into their uh, feeling into how they arise for different reasons and learning how to not somehow take it personally or condemn ourselves for doing what the, what the mind does naturally, right? And then also it can feel like at times our, we notice our life through our thoughts. And so it can feel like our thoughts kind of illuminate something for us, right? Sometimes when we start to notice our thoughts, we might feel like, well, I'm in a bad mood. Right? And we notice all these self critical thoughts or these judgmental thoughts. Have you ever noticed that before? Or it's just me. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes. It's it's definitely me. <laughs> and when these self critical thoughts come forward or we notice like, oh, we're in a bad mood, we can notice when we can notice the absence of being in a bad mood. Be, because it, sometimes it, it can feel like we've been in a bad mood for hours, right? Or like, well, I woke up in a bad mood and I'm going to be in a bad mood all day and now it's noon and I'm still in a bad mood and now it's five and I'm still in a bad mood. But we haven't, that, that is kind of a, a, a diluted idea, right? It's, not, it's kind of a confused idea because it's actually not true that we've been in a bad mood all day. But it is true that we've noticed something about the mood or something about the, the thoughts that point back to the mood, right? And so we can get good, one way of noticing and working with thinking is to get good at noticing the gaps, noticing when we're not in a bad mood, right? And because we know something about all experience, we know something about sound, we know something about what we see, what we know something about body sensations, that everything comes and goes, nothing sticks here forever. Right? That's one of the laws of nature. Nothing is permanent. We, that's also true for thoughts because it's one of the six categories of experience. It's just the same as everything else. It's just more subtle. We don't notice it as much, but it also comes and goes just like everything else. It's also not self, just like everything else. And so when, a, when some conglomeration of thoughts arise that allow us to think something about ourselves, like I'm in a bad mood, for example, or like I'm, I'm this kind of a person and I'm always going to be this kind of a person, right? I'm an anxious person or I'm an angry person or whatever the case is. We might, that might reoccur a thousand times, but every moment is a new moment to know, oh, this is just impermanent like everything else, right? And there are gaps between this moment and the next moment. They might be small, right? They might be slight, but there are gaps. And so that's a, good act, that's a good activity that we can give our minds. Like, oh, can we notice when the mind's not in a bad mood? Let me see if I can notice when I'm not angry today. Let me see if I can notice when I'm not anxious today, right? And see if we can, we can inspire that wisdom to be there a little more often for us. Because it's not true, but it feels like it's true, right? And it's probably true that we're not upset or not angry or not the angry person or not the the person that we don't want to be or whatever our thoughts are telling us to be more often than we know right this for whatever reason this embodied system has dealt with anxiety you know i've had anxiety in my life from my earliest memories and i remember learning how to do this and like oh wow 
It's amazing. I, if you would have asked me, I would have said, oh, I'm anxious most of every day. But it's definitely not true. There's so many moments when I'm not anxious. And, when, I'm, and when, I'm, when I notice that I'm not anxious, it undermines that sense of personalizing it. Like, oh, because I'm not an anxious, I can't say that I'm an anxious pe person if I'm not anxious all the time. And when I no notice that I'm not anxious all the, all the time, that it undermines that tendency, right? So noticing thoughts can be a real benefit. It can be a benefit to help us see that everything changes, that we're not, we don't always have to, we don't have to be the, we don't have to peg ourselves as this kind of person all for all time, or this is going to be my our habits of mind for all time, or right, or, or somehow our experience is fixed. Like somehow who we are is fixed. It's not. We're always growing, learning, learning, and changing. People, not the same for all time. Yeah. Does that help any, or further confuse? This is helpful. Oh, a little helpful. Great, thanks. I work with children with special needs, and sometimes I try to tell them, like, we get big emotions. It doesn't have to be good or bad, it's just a big emotion. Yeah. So sometimes I just try to neutralize it and just say, like, what we're feeling in our bodies versus maybe analyzing it. And it actually helps me as well because I tend to be more on the anxious side, but um, and sometimes with adults, we, and I just kind of analyze things a lot, and then it becomes kind of like too much. I just kind of like simplify it. Yeah. But for me, it's an ongoing thing all day. <laughs> I just gotta laugh about it, but sometimes Thank it helps me. But. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Any comments or reflections from the Zoom, from the Zoomers? I would say something. Yeah, please. Um, I have noticed that things like obsessions and compulsions and addictions seem like a fortress or like a real human being almost. But when you shine enlightenment and awareness on them, you see that they are imperfect and always changing and full of holes, leaks, and, and you can see how they can dissipate. And the same is true with pain, which seems like it is one thing that cannot be moved and yet if we pay close attention to pain it is also always moving like everything um some things are not as powerful as we think that they are well said anybody else want to jump in Perhaps we'll leave it here for tonight. So thanks to everybody for joining in. Thanks for your practice. Um, I'll be back next week, and the practice for this week is to do some more loving kindness practice. So um, there's a there's a handout on the website, the intro class. You can read that. A little bit of information about loving kindness practice. You can listen to the recording. I'll send it out. Um, with the, the meditation and just do do your best to practice as much as you can this week and hopefully have come back and share our reflections with each other for the final class next week all right all right thanks friends take care <laughs> hi marianne <laughs>